One. Gabriel Oak. Farmer Gabriel Oak was a quiet, sensible man. He was twenty-eight years old and unmarried. And he was a man of good character. On Sundays, he went to church and prayed. During the week, he worked in the fields of his farm. On a sunny morning in December, Gabriel Oak walked across his field on Norcombe Hill in the county of Wessex. He looked towards the road which went between Emminster and Chalk Newton and saw a bright yellow wagon. Two horses were pulling the heavy wagon slowly along the road. The driver was walking beside the wagon, which was loaded with furniture. A woman was sitting on top of the furniture. She was young and very attractive. Suddenly, the driver called to her. Something has fallen off the wagon, miss. I'll go back and get it. The young woman waited quietly. She did not get down from the wagon to help the driver. After several minutes, she looked back to see if the wagon driver was returning. He was not. So she opened a small package that was beside her. She took a mirror from the package and held it up to her face. As she looked in the mirror, she smiled. The sun shone down onto the woman's red jacket, her pretty face and her dark hair. Gabriel Oak watched her and smiled. The girl did not touch her hat or her hair. She simply looked at herself and smiled. Then she heard the wagon driver returning to the wagon. She put the mirror into the package and waited for him to drive the horses forward. When the wagon moved on, Gabriel Oak followed it to the toll gate. As he came nearer to the wagon, Oak heard the driver arguing with the man at the gate. The toll is two pence said the gatekeeper. But this wagon is large. You must pay two pence extra. But the young woman would not pay the extra money. Oak thought that two pence was too small an amount to argue about. He held out two pennies to the gatekeeper. Take this and let the young woman go through, he said. The young woman looked down at Oak. She did not thank him, but she told her driver to go on. Oak and the gatekeeper watched her as the wagon passed. She's a handsome woman, said the gatekeeper. That's true, said Oak, but unfortunately she knows it. It was nearly midnight on 21st December, the shortest day of the year. There were no clouds in the dark sky and the stars were shining brightly. A cold wind was blowing, but it was not the sound of the wind that travellers could hear on Norcombe Hill. It was the sound of music. The music came from a little wooden shepherd's hut that belonged to Gabriel Oak. Inside the hut, Gabriel was playing a happy tune on his flute. The hut was on wheels, and it gave shelter for the shepherd in the winter and early spring. He stayed in the hut while he cared for his sheep. At this time of the year, the sheep were giving birth to their lambs. It was warm and comfortable inside the hut. 
Oak had a small stove to keep him warm, and he had some bread, cheese and beer. Oak's father had been a shepherd, and he had taught Gabriel all that he knew about sheep. Now the young man had 200 sheep, two sheepdogs and a farm of his own. He had not yet paid for the sheep, and it was important to guard the sheep and their young lambs during the night. After a few minutes, Oak stopped playing his flute, picked up a lamp and went outside. As he moved around the field, he held the light high and looked at each sheep. Twenty minutes later, he returned to the hut with a newborn lamb. It was weak and cold. After an hour in the warm hut, the lamb became stronger. Oak took the little lamb back outside and left it with its mother. Suddenly, he saw a light shining in a field next to his own farm. Lamplight was coming from a cowshed that was built into the side of the hill. Oak walked down the hill until he stood above the roof of the wooden building. He looked through a hole in the roof. Inside the cowshed, two women were sitting beside a cow and its young calf. A lamp was standing on the floor of the cowshed. The soft yellow light shone on the women and the animals. One woman was about fifty years old. The other was younger, but she was wearing a cloak which hid her face. We can go home now, said the older woman. I hope that the cows will be all right. If we were rich, we could pay a man to do these things, said the younger woman. Well, we aren't rich, so we must do the work ourselves, said the older woman. And you must help me if you stay on the farm. Aunt, I've lost my hat, said the younger woman. The wind blew it into the next field. Suddenly. The cloak fell back from the young woman's head, and Oak saw her long black hair and her red jacket. Oak recognised her at once. It was the young woman who had been in the yellow wagon. The young woman who liked to look at herself in the mirror. The young woman who owed him two pence. The two women put the calf next to its mother. Then they picked up their lamp and went out of the hut and down the hill. Oak went back to his sheep. When it began to get light, Oak remembered the girl's lost hat. He went to look for it in his field. He found the hat under a hedge and took it back to his hut. Later in the morning, Oak saw the young woman on the road. He was surprised. She was riding her horse like a man. She did not ride side saddle like a lady. She had pulled up her long skirt and each of her legs were down the sides of the horse. He smiled and watched her ride away down the hill. An hour later, the young woman returned. She was riding side saddle now. Oak got the hat from his hut and stepped onto the road in front of her. I found a hat, miss, he said, and he held it up towards her. It's mine, she said. She smiled and took the hat. It flew off my head in the wind last night. At one o'clock this morning? Yes. How did you know that? She asked. I was here with my sheep. 
You're Farmer Oak, she said. Yes, he said. And I saw you again about an hour ago. Her face became red. She was remembering her ride down the hill. He had seen her riding astride like a man. Oak turned away. He had not wanted to embarrass her. When he turned back, she was gone. Five mornings and evenings went by. The young woman came to the cowshed to take care of the cows, which had newborn calves. But she did not speak to Oak. He watched her each day, and his heart ached. Then one evening, he was very tired. He came back to his shepherd's hut and shut the door. It was a cold night, and he was pleased to be near the warm stove. But he forgot to open one of the little windows. It was important to do this when a fire was burning in the stove and the door was shut. In a few minutes, Oak fell asleep. When Oak opened his eyes again, his head was aching. He looked up and saw the face of the young woman. His head was in her arms, and she was opening the top of his shirt. What's the matter? asked Oak. Nothing, now, she replied. But you could have died. You forgot to open a window. Oh, said Oak. He wanted to stay with his head in her arms forever but she made him sit up. I heard your dog barking, she told him. It was trying to open the door of the hut. I came to see what was wrong. You saved my life, miss, said Oak. But, but I don't know your name. I know your aunt's name. It's Mrs. Hurst, but I don't know yours. You don't have to know my name, she replied, and I don't like it. You'll soon get a new name when you marry. Well, Farmer Oak, she said, do you always speak so, so plainly? I'm sorry, miss, said Oak. I did not mean to be rude. I'm not clever with words. I'm a plain man, and I speak plainly and honestly. But I do thank you. Please, let me shake your hand. Oak held the young woman's hand in his own. How soft it is, he said quietly. You're thinking I would like to kiss her hand, she said. Well... You can, if you want to. I wasn't thinking that at all, but... Then you won't, she said, and she pulled her hand away. Now you must find out my name, she said, laughing, and she went away. Chapter 2 Bathsheba Oak learnt that the young woman's name was Bathsheba Everdeen, and he realised that he was in love. He thought about her all the time. He thought about her face, her hair, her soft hands. He said her name, Bathsheba, again and again. I must marry her, he said to himself. She must be my wife, or I'll not be good for anything again. When Bathsheba no longer visited the cowshed, he went to her aunt's house. He knocked at the door of the farmhouse, and Mrs. Hurst opened the door. Mr. Oak, she said. Can I see Miss Everdeen? said Oak. 
I've brought a lamb for her to care for. Its mother died. Girls sometimes like to take care of a lamb. Well, I don't know, said Mrs. Hurst. Bathsheba is only a visitor here. She won't be staying long on my farm, and she's not here at the moment. Do you want to wait for her? Yes, I'll wait, said Oak, and he sat in a chair. The lamb isn't the real reason I came here, Mrs. Hurst. I want to ask Miss Everdeen if she would like to be married. I would be very happy to marry her. Do you know if there are any other young men who want to marry her? Oh, yes, said Mrs. Hurst. It's not surprising, because she's so pretty and so clever. The young men never come here, of course, but there are ten or more young men who want to marry her. Oh, then I won't wait, said Oak. I'm only an ordinary man. My best chance was to be the first man to propose to her. He was walking back across the fields when he heard someone give a shout. He turned round and saw Bathsheba running after him. Farmer Oak, she called. She stopped in front of him, breathing fast. My aunt made a mistake, she said. There aren't any other young men who have proposed to me. Is this true? said Oak. I'm very happy to hear that. He held out his hand, but she quickly put her own hand behind her back. I have a nice little farmhouse and some good fields, he went on. I haven't paid for the farm yet, but when we're married... Farmer Oak, Bathsheba said, surprised. I never said that I was going to marry you. I only wanted to tell you of my aunt's mistake. Oak was disappointed. Think about my proposal, he said softly. I'll wait, Miss Everdeen. Please, Bathsheba, I love you more than my life. I'll think about what you have said, she replied. Give me time before I must answer. I can make you happy, he said. In a year or two, I will have earned more money. You can have a piano and a little carriage which you can drive to the market each week. I should like that, she said. We'll be comfortable and happy in our home, and I'll be there by the fire whenever you look up. And whenever I look up, there you will be. Bathsheba was silent for a few minutes, and he watched her. Then she said, No, I don't want to marry you, Farmer Oak. A wedding in a church would be nice, and people would say nice things about me. But a husband... Yes, said Oak quickly. A husband would always be there, she said. If I could have a wedding without having a husband, but I can't. So I won't marry anyone. Not yet. What a stupid thing to say, said Oak. But, my dear, why won't you marry me? Because I don't love you, she answered. But I love you, said Oak, and I will love you and want you until I die. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Oak, she said. We couldn't be happy as man and wife. I'm too independent. I need a husband who is a stronger character than me, and I live with my aunt and have no money. You need a woman with money. You need a rich wife 
who can buy more sheep for your farm and help it to grow. But... began Oak. No, no, I can't marry you, said Bathsheba. Then she laughed. I don't love you. I would be stupid if I married you. Oak did not like people laughing at him. Then I'll not ask you again, he said quietly. It is not easy to stop loving someone, and Oak soon found out that this was true. A few days after Oak's proposal, Bathsheba went to Weatherbury, which was more than twenty miles away. Had she gone to live in the town, or was she only visiting it? Oak did not know. But his love for Bathsheba grew stronger now that she was further away from him. And then something happened that changed his life. One night, Oak came back to his house and called his two sheepdogs. But only the older dog came home. Oak did not worry about the younger dog. He'll come back soon, he thought, and he went to bed. Very early the next morning, as the sky began to get light, Oak woke up suddenly. He had heard the sound of sheep's bells ringing. The sheep were running on the hill, and the bells around their necks were ringing loudly. Oak knew that something was wrong. He jumped from his bed and put on his clothes quickly. Then he ran out of the house, down the lane, and on to Norcombe Hill. Oak had 250 sheep. 50 sheep and their young lambs were in one field. 200 pregnant sheep were in a second field. Their lambs were going to be born in a week or two, and these sheep had disappeared. Oak began to call the sheep. Then he saw that the fence was broken. He ran through the hole in the fence and looked up to the top of the hill. His younger dog was standing there. Suddenly, Oak knew the terrible truth. The young dog had become excited and had chased the sheep. Oak ran to the top of the hill and looked down. Below the other side of the hill, there was a deep chalk pit. At the bottom of the pit lay his sheep, two hundred of them. And inside the dead or dying bodies of the sheep were two hundred unborn lambs. At first, Oak felt very sorry for the sheep and their lambs. But moments later, he realised that he had lost more than his sheep. I'm ruined, he thought. The sheep were not insured, and I have no more money. I cannot buy more sheep. The next day, Oak took his gun and shot the young dog. A bank had given him money so that he could buy the sheep. Now he had to sell everything so that he could repay the debt. Thank God that I'm not married to Bathsheba, he thought. I've lost everything. I have nothing but the clothes that I'm wearing. Chapter 3 The Fire Two months later, Gabriel Oak was at the market in the town of Casterbridge. It was now the month of February. Oak was at the hiring fair. 
He wanted to work as a farm manager, but he had been unlucky. No one had hired him. During the morning, he saw a regiment of soldiers leaving the town. Should I become a soldier? Gabriel thought. The army would pay me each month. It would give me food, clothes, and somewhere to live. The next day, Gabriel decided to go to another village, which was ten miles on the other side of Weatherbury. He would try to find work there. Perhaps someone would hire him as a shepherd. Gabriel bought a shepherd's crook, and then he started walking. Is Bathsheba still living in Weatherbury? he thought. After he had walked three or four miles, Gabriel saw a wagon standing beneath some trees. There was no horse with the wagon, but there was a large pile of hay on the top of it. I'm tired, and that hay will make a good soft bed, Gabriel thought. He climbed into the wagon and covered himself with hay. He was asleep after only a few minutes. When Gabriel woke up again, it was dark, and the wagon was moving. He could hear men's voices. She's not married, and she's a very handsome woman, said one man. But she knows that she's pretty. The other man gave a short laugh. I'm much too shy to look at her, he said. Tell me, Billy Smallbury, does she pay her work as well? I don't know, Joe Poorgrass. Are these men talking about Bathsheba? thought Gabriel. No, the woman they're speaking about is the owner of a farm. Gabriel looked at the road they were travelling on. He guessed that the wagon was near Weatherbury now. He jumped down onto the road and climbed over a gate into a field. The two men in the wagon did not see him. Gabriel had to find a place to sleep for the rest of the night. He began walking. After a few minutes, he saw a strange light about half a mile away. Gabriel watched the light growing bigger and brighter. Something was burning. Gabriel ran towards the fire and saw that a rick of straw was burning. The powerful flames were reaching across to another rick, a rick of wheat. And past this, there were more wheat ricks. All the wheat from the farm's fields was kept in these ricks, and soon they would be burnt. Farm workers were running around the farmyard. People were shouting, Fire! Fire! But nobody seemed to know what to do. Nobody knew how to put out the flames. Quickly! Get a rick cloth! shouted Gabriel. Make it wet! and hang it between the straw rick and the wheat rick. The cloth might stop the flames reaching across to the other ricks. Some of the men did this. They found a rick cloth and put it into a pond to make it wet. Then they pulled the wet cloth up onto two tall poles between the ricks. Get a ladder, shouted Gabriel. And some buckets of water. Hurry! The ladder that was against the straw rick was burnt, shouted a man. Gabriel quickly climbed to the top of the wheat rick. He used his hands and feet to pull himself up. Gabriel began to beat the flames which were on the stalks of wheat with his shepherd's crook. He was trying to put out the flames. Billy Smallbury, one of the men who had been driving the wagon, had found another ladder. He put it against the wheat rick and climbed up onto the rick with a bucket of water. 
He poured the water over Oak's face and clothes to stop the flames burning him. On the ground, groups of farm workers tried to stop the fire, but they could not do very much. A dark-haired young woman sat on a horse, away from the heat and smoke. She watched the workers moving around the ricks. Another young woman, one of her maids, stood next to her. Who's that man on the rick, Marianne? asked the young woman. He's a shepherd, I think, ma'am, said the maid. Who does he work for? asked the woman on the horse. I don't know, ma'am, replied Mary Ann. Nobody knows. I've asked many people. He's a stranger. The young woman on the horse called to one of the men. Jan Coggan, are the wheat ricks safe? They're safe now, ma'am, replied Coggan. Thanks to the shepherd. Mary Ann, go and thank the shepherd for me, said the woman on the horse. After about ten minutes, Gabriel Oak climbed down to the ground, and Mary Ann went across to him. The farmer wants to thank you, she told Oak. Where is he? asked Oak. Perhaps there was work for a shepherd here. It's not a he, it's a she, said Mary Ann. A woman farmer? Yes, and a rich one too, said a villager who was near them. Her uncle died a few months ago, and now this farm is hers. She has business in every bank in Casterbridge. Oak walked across to the woman on the horse. The flames had burned small holes in his clothes. His face was dirty from the smoke. He took off his hat and spoke politely. Do you want a shepherd, miss? he asked. And then he saw the young woman's face more clearly. It was Bathsheba Everdeen. She did not reply, so Oak asked the question again. This time there was sadness in his voice. Do you want a shepherd, miss? Bathsheba Everdeen had almost forgotten Oak's proposal of marriage, but she remembered it now, two months later. She felt a little sorry for Gabriel, but she was pleased for herself. She saw that Gabriel was now a poor man, and she had been luckier. Yes, she said kindly. I do want to hire a shepherd. He's the right man, ma'am, said one of the farm workers. Yes, he is, said a second man. Speak to my farm manager, Mr Pennyways, Bathsheba said to Gabriel. Then she turned her horse and rode away. Gabriel spoke to Mr. Pennyways about his new work as a shepherd. Then he followed the farm workers towards the village. He needed to find a place to live. As he walked, Gabriel thought about Bathsheba. She was not the young girl that he remembered. She was a farm owner now. Gabriel reached an old church. Beside the tree, there was a churchyard, which was surrounded by old trees. Suddenly, he saw a young woman standing beneath one of the trees. Is this the right way to the village? he asked her. Yes, she replied with a sweet, low voice. Are you a stranger in Weatherbury? Yes, said Gabriel. I'm the new shepherd. I've just arrived. You're only a shepherd? Oh, I thought that you were a farmer. She spoke quietly and sadly. Please don't tell anyone in the village that you've seen me. 
I don't want them to know about me. Gabriel felt sorry for the sad young woman. He gave her a little money before he went on. Chapter 4 A Valentine Gabriel Oak went to an inn called Warren's Malt House. There he found other farm workers drinking beer. Come in, Shepherd, said one of the men when he saw Gabriel at the door. You're welcome in Weatherbury, although we don't know your name. My name is Gabriel Oak he told them, and sat down. Tell me, is Miss Everdeen a good employer? We don't know, said Jan Coggan. She came here a few days ago, after her uncle died. She owns his farm now, and she's going to keep it. I need somewhere to stay, said Gabriel. Does anyone have a room in a cottage that I can pay for? Jan Coggan told Gabriel that he could stay in his home, and the two men left the inn together. Another farm worker, Henry Frey, also went out of the inn at the same time, but he returned minutes later, looking very excited. I've just heard some news about Pennyways he said. Miss Everdeen caught him stealing wheat. She sent him away. Everyone began to talk about Pennyways, Miss Everdeen's dishonest farm manager. Henry Frey bought another mug of beer. But before he had lifted the mug to his mouth, another farm worker came running into the inn. Have you heard the news? he asked. Is this news about Pennyways, said Henry, or is it more news, Laban Tall? It's news about Fanny Robin, Miss Everdeen's youngest maid, said Laban. Fanny has disappeared. Miss Everdeen wants to speak to all of us before we go to bed. All the workers went along the lane to Weatherbury Farm, where Bathsheba lived. When she saw them arrive, she opened a window and called down to them. Tomorrow morning, I want two or three of you to look for Fanny Robin, she said. Was she courting any young man in the village? From another open window, Mary Ann spoke. She wasn't courting anyone in the village, ma'am said the maid. But she's been visiting Casterbridge. She's been courting a soldier at the barracks there. But I don't know his name. Billy Smallbury, said Bathsheba, looking down at a heavy young man who was carrying a lamp. If Fanny doesn't return tomorrow, you must go to Casterbridge. Try to find out the soldier's name. Then she closed her window and the men went home. The next day, Bathsheba and her maid, Liddy Smallbury, were looking through some books and papers that had belonged to Bathsheba's uncle. Suddenly, there was a knock at the front door. Liddy went to the window and looked out. It's Mr. Boldwood, ma'am, she said. Bathsheba looked at the dust on her dress and hands. Oh, I can't see him now, she said. Go and ask him what he wants. Liddy came back a few minutes later. Mr. Boldwood asked about Fanny, she said. He worries about her. Fanny had no friends or family when she was a young girl, and Mr. Boldwood paid for her to go to school. He's a very kind man. Who is he? asked Bathsheba. 
He's your neighbour, said Liddy. He owns Little Weatherbury, the farm beside yours. He's about forty years old and very rich. All the girls of the village have tried to marry Mr. Boldwood, but he's just not interested. Later that day, Bathsheba sent for all her farm workers. They met together in one of the large farm buildings. As you know, Pennyways has left the farm, she told them. But I'm not going to hire another farm manager. I'm going to manage the farm myself. The men looked at each other. They were very surprised. Did this young woman know how to manage a farm? But before they could speak, Bathsheba turned to Billy Smallbury. Billy, what have you learnt about Fanny Robin and her soldier? She asked. Many of the soldiers left Casterbridge last week, said Billy. I think that Fanny's young man is a member of the 11th Dragoon Guards. He went to Melchester with the rest of his regiment. Fanny has followed him, but nobody knows his name. That night, many miles north of Weatherbury, a person dressed in a cloak moved along a path between a river and a high stone building. Grey clouds were low in the sky, and it was very cold. Snow was falling. The bell of Melchester's church clock rang ten times as the person walked slowly towards the army barracks building. A few moments later, the person stopped and threw a stone up at a high window. The window opened. Who's there? called a man's voice. Sergeant Troy? a girl's voice asked. Sergeant Frank Troy? Yes, replied the man, leaning out of the window. He wore a red coat and blue trousers, the uniform of a dragoon guardsman. The dragoon looked down at the girl standing below him. Snow fell onto her face and cloak. Frank, this is Fanny Robin. Fanny, how did you find me? asked Troy. I asked someone which was the window of your room, she said. Frank, are you pleased to see me? Oh, well, yes. When will we be married, Frank? You promised. Wait, he said. I didn't expect you to come here so soon. I didn't expect you to come at all. Fanny began to cry. Frank, I love you. And you said lots of times that you would marry me. Don't cry, he said. I will marry you, if I made that promise. I'll come and see you tomorrow. I'm staying in rooms at Mrs. Twill's house in North Street, said Fanny. Good night, Frank. Good night. The next time that there was a market in Casterbridge, Bathsheba went into the town. She went to the corn exchange. She was the only woman there, and all the men stared at her. All except one, Farmer William Boldwood of Little Weatherbury Farm. This rich, handsome gentleman did not seem to notice her. Bathsheba was surprised and annoyed. She was a beautiful woman, and she knew this. Most men found her attractive. One Sunday, Bathsheba was talking with Liddy. It was the 13th of February, and a dark, cold winter afternoon. The two women were sitting together by the fire in the kitchen of the farmhouse. Did you see Mr. Boldwood in church this morning, ma'am? asked Liddy. 
No, said Bathsheba. He was sitting opposite you. Are you sure that you didn't see him? said Liddy, smiling. I did not, replied Bathsheba. And he didn't seem to notice you, said Liddy. Why should he? said Bathsheba. Every other man in the church looked at you, said Liddy. But Mr. Boldwood didn't even turn his head towards you. Bathsheba was silent for some minutes. Then she said, Oh, I bought a valentine card yesterday. I almost forgot about it. A valentine card? said Liddy excitedly. Who is it for? Farmer Boldwood? No, said Bathsheba. It's for Teddy Coggan, Jan Coggan's son. She took the card from her desk. Teddy's a lovely child. I wanted him to get his first Valentine card from me. It will be fun to send the card to Boldwood, said Liddy, laughing. Bathsheba thought about this for a moment. All the other important men in the area admired her, but Boldwood did not even notice her. She was annoyed. You're right, Liddy, she said. We'll send the card to Boldwood. It will be a good joke. Bathsheba wrote Boldwood's name and address on the front of an envelope and put the card inside it. Then she laughed and wrote the words, Marry me, on the back of the envelope. That evening, the valentine was sent to Boldwood. It was a joke, but Bathsheba would soon wish that she had never done it. On the evening of St. Valentine's Day, the 14th of February, Farmer Boldwood sat down to eat his supper. On the dining table next to him was the valentine card. Since it had arrived that morning, Boldwood had asked himself these questions many times. Who has sent the card? Marry me are the words on the back of the envelope. Which woman would send such a message to me? Boldwood could not sleep that night. At dawn he got out of his bed, but he did not eat breakfast. He went out into the fields and watched the sun come up over the cold, snowy hills. Then he walked back to the road. Suddenly he heard a noise behind him and turned around. The mail cart was coming along the road towards his farmhouse. When he reached Boldwood, the driver stopped and held out a letter towards him. The farmer took the envelope and started to open it. But the mail cart driver said, I don't think that the letter is for you, sir. I think it's for your shepherd. Boldwood looked at the envelope and read the words. To the new shepherd, Weatherbury Farm near Casterbridge. You've made a mistake, said Boldwood. This letter isn't for me or my shepherd. It's for Miss Everdeen Shepherd, Gabriel Oak, at Weatherbury Farm. This is Little Weatherbury Farm. At that moment, he saw someone moving on the hill. There's Oak. I'll take the letter to him myself. When he reached the top of the hill, Farmer Boldwood called to the shepherd. Oak, I met the mail cart, and this letter was delivered to me. But it was a mistake. The letter is for you. I'm sorry that I started to open it. Gabriel Oak took the letter from the envelope and read it. Dear friend, I do not know your name, but I want to thank you. You were kind to me on the night that I left Weatherbury. 
I am going to be married to the young man who has been courting me. His name is Sergeant Troy, and he is a man of honour. He would not want me to keep your money, so I am returning it to you. Please do not tell anyone about this letter. As soon as we are husband and wife, we will come to Weatherbury. Thank you again for your kindness. Fanny Robin Gabriel gave the letter to Boldwood. I know that you're worried about Fanny Robin, he said. You must read this. Boldwood read the letter and looked unhappy. What kind of man is Sergeant Troy? asked Gabriel. Is he a good and honest man? He's young and handsome, said Boldwood, and many women love him. But I don't think that Troy wants to marry anyone. Poor Fanny. After a moment, Boldwood put his hand in his pocket. He took out the envelope containing the Valentine card. Tell me, Oak, he said. Do you know who wrote this? Gabriel looked at the writing on the envelope. It's Miss Everdeen's handwriting he said. He looked quickly at Boldwood. The farmer turned his head and looked across the hill. A person who receives a valentine will try and find out who sent it, he said. Everyone expects that will happen. But Boldwood spoke seriously. He was not enjoying the joke. A few minutes later, he returned to his house. A day or two later, a handsome young dragoon walked into All Souls Church. He was wearing his red jacket and blue trousers and carried a shining helmet with a tall crest. A long sword hung from a belt at the sergeant's waist. The dragoon waited for the young woman who was to be his wife. He waited and waited but she did not come. The silver spurs on the dragoon's boots rang like little bells as he walked up and down. After half an hour, he left the church. As he walked away from the church, he met a young woman. She was running towards the church. When she saw the soldier, the young woman looked frightened. Oh, oh Frank, she cried. I made a mistake. I went to the wrong church. I went to All Saints Church. I'm sorry, but it doesn't matter. We can be married tomorrow instead. You fool, Fanny, said Sergeant Francis Troy. Get married tomorrow? No. I waited at the church, but you didn't come. You embarrassed me. I won't do this again for a long time, I promise you. Chapter 5 Mr. Boldwood's Proposal On Saturday morning, Farmer William Boldwood was at Casterbridge Market when Bathsheba arrived. For several nights, Boldwood's dreams had been about Bathsheba Everdeen. But now, for the first time, he looked at her closely. He saw her black hair, the shape of her face, her clothes, and he saw that she was beautiful. This is the woman who has asked me to marry her he thought. Bathsheba saw him watching her and smiled. He knows who sent the Valentine card, she thought, but only a joke made him notice me. Suddenly, Bathsheba was sorry. She respected Boldwood. She was sorry that she had disturbed this quiet, calm man's life. 
Boldwood was a serious man, but he had strong feelings. As the weeks passed and spring came, he watched Bathsheba. He watched her from his fields next to her farm. At last, he decided to speak to her. One morning in May, Boldwood saw Bathsheba at the sheep-washing pool with Gabriel Oak and her other farm workers. She was watching the men push each sheep down into the water. The women were watching and laughing as the water splashed over everyone. When she saw Boldwood, Bathsheba moved away and began to walk towards the river. Boldwood followed her. Miss Everdeen, he said, when they were both walking next to the river. I can't think sensibly about anything or anybody since I saw you clearly. So I've come to make you a proposal of marriage. More than anything in the world, I want you to be my wife. Bathsheba tried to stay calm. She stopped walking and looked at him. Mr. Boldwood she said carefully. I admire you and respect you, but I can't marry you. Miss Everdeen, my life is empty without you, said Boldwood. Oh, I wish that I could court you with pretty words. Let me say again and again that I love you. I want you to be my wife. I'm speaking to you now because you gave me hope. You wrote, marry me, on the valentine. I was wrong and foolish to send you that valentine, said Bathsheba. Please forgive me. I promise that I'll never play jokes again. No, no, don't say this, cried Boldwood. His eyes shone fiercely as he spoke, and he stood close to her. I don't love you, Mr. Boldwood, said Bathsheba. She was frightened by his strong feelings. Please, don't speak about this any more. I can't think clearly. I didn't know that you were going to say this to me. Don't say that you'll never love me, he said quickly. Let me speak to you about this again. Let me hope that one day you will accept my proposal. No, don't hope, Bathsheba replied. Give me time. Let me think. Yes, I'll give you time, he said quietly. I'll wait. Bathsheba was not in love with Boldwood so she was able to think calmly about his proposal. Many women would be proud to marry Boldwood. She knew this. The farmer was a man of good character, and he was rich. I started a foolish game by sending that valentine, she thought. But perhaps I should be honest now. Perhaps I should marry him. But I can't do it. The day after Boldwood made his proposal, Bathsheba went to see Gabriel Oak. Tell me, she said to him, did the workers say anything about me and Mr. Boldwood? They think that you will probably marry him before the end of the year, said Gabriel. How stupid, said Bathsheba. I want you to tell them that it's not true. Gabriel was surprised when he heard this, but he was also happy. Yes, I can tell them, he said. But do you want my opinion, Bathsheba? You should call me Miss Everdeen, she said coldly. But she did want Gabriel's opinion. She respected him more than anyone else. Well, what do you have to say? she asked. You were wrong to send Farmer Boldwood the valentine card, said Gabriel. It was unkind and dishonest. 
Bathsheba's face became red, and she said angrily, I'm not interested in your opinion. And why am I unkind and dishonest? Is it because I didn't marry you? No, said Gabriel quietly. I stopped thinking about my proposal a long time ago. And you'll never wish to ask again, I suppose, she said. But she expected him to say that he still loved her. No, I don't wish to, he said. But I repeat, you were wrong when you sent Mr. Boldwood that valentine. It was cruel and dishonest. I won't let you speak to me like that, said Bathsheba. She was shaking with anger. Please, leave my farm at the end of the week. I'll be happier if I go now, said Gabriel. Very well, go, she said. I don't want to see you again. Twenty-four hours later, three of Bathsheba's farm workers came running to her house with terrible news. Sixty of your sheep broke the fence around their field, said Joe Poorgrass. And they got into a field of clover, said Henry Frey. They've eaten the clover and they're all sick, said Laban Tall. Their stomachs are swollen. They'll die if someone doesn't help them. Bathsheba hurried out to the field with the men. Her sheep were lying on the ground. Their stomachs were very swollen, and they groaned in pain. Oh, what can we do? she cried. Someone must make a hole in their sides and let out the air, said Laban. You need a special tool to make a small hole. And there's only one man who can do this, said Joseph Poorgrass. Gabriel Oak. Don't speak his name, said Bathsheba angrily. I don't want to hear it. Perhaps Farmer Boldwood will help us. No, ma'am, said Laban. This happened to two of his sheep a few days ago. He sent for Shepherd Oak, and Shepherd Oak saved them. I'll never send for him, never, said Bathsheba. Suddenly, one of the sheep jumped up, then fell heavily onto the ground. It did not move, and Bathsheba went to look at it. The sheep was dead. Oh, what shall I do? What shall I do? She cried. She looked at the dead sheep for several moments. Then she said, Laban, take a horse and ride quickly. Find Oak and give him this order. Tell the shepherd that he must return immediately. Laban took one of the horses from a field and rode away. Bathsheba watched the man and the horse disappear over the hill. Then she began to walk up and down beside the sick sheep. After an hour, Laban returned. He was alone. Well, said Bathsheba, where is Shepherd Oak? Gabriel won't come until you ask him politely, ma'am, said Laban. What? Is that his answer? Suddenly, another sheep jumped into the air and fell dead. Bathsheba began to cry. Oh, how can Oak be so cruel? Gabriel is a good man, ma'am, said Laban. He'll come if you ask him and not order him. Bathsheba hurried back to the house. She wrote these words in a note. Do not desert me, Gabriel. Laban rode away with the note. Fifteen minutes later, he returned with Gabriel Oak. Gabriel went straight to the sheep and began to work on them. He pushed a sharp tool into the side of each sheep 
and let out the air in their swollen stomachs. He saved all except four of the animals. Bathsheba came and stood beside him. Gabriel, I... I was wrong to send you away. Will you stay with me? She asked, smiling. I will, he said.